Well, Henry, thank you very much for that. And thank you to um, Mimi and Henry and others who invited me to um, speak today. Uh, and thank you for you for um, sticking it out to the uh, end and uh, still being here um, to hear me speak. Can you hear me at the back? Is that, this is okay? Good, all right. So I hope you'll forgive me if I read my paper, but I want to kind of be synthetic and bring together um, different thoughts. So I need to have a way to maintain my own structure. So I've really enjoyed this conference. I think I should uh, congratulate those who've organized it. Um, and what I've really enjoyed uh, is the way in which it's brought together some very different constituencies uh, to have a common conversation. So I see educators, political scientists, and civic activists here who seek to reinvigorate tired institutions of learning and participation with the exciting potential of the digital. I see those who are primarily committed to children and youth asking what they need and deserve, especially now the digital seems to overturn generational hierarchies and unsettle authoritative adult structures with the exuberance of youthful creativity. I see technologists and designers here too, fascinated by what can be made and done and hoping to see new ways of thinking and acting, enabled by new ways of connecting people and ideas. And I come from a fourth constituency and there are a few of us here um, also Henry for one, I think, for whom the emphasis in digital media um, originated at least less on the digital and more on the media. So although our different starting points fuse and intersect, for me the fascination lies in the shift from a communication environment that of course through the whole of history has been primarily managed face to face, then increasingly complemented and perhaps even overtaken for a while by mass media, and now, as we enter a thoroughly mediated world, shaped by interactive, convergent, and networked media, populated as much by hybridized and intersecting texts and forms as by creative and participatory, though also socially constrained, readers. But I don't want to be media-centric. What matters about the media is less, I think, the changes in media per se than in how they shape, influence, enable, or undermine the activities of young people, parents, teachers, educators, politicians, youth workers, and so on. In other words, I'm interested in the mediation of education, identity, citizenship, relationships, and knowledge. So once, as I see it, media technologies occupied a discrete portion of our analytic space, along with other institutions or social and personal spheres, education, work, family, citizenship, and media. We could analyze each separately and interrogate their overlaps. The media were nouns, television, radio, cinema, press. But as analog media were replaced by the digital, an adjective, it seems that everything has become mediated. So now we must contend with the contemporary prefixing of digital to almost anything and everything interesting, resulting in the construction of an extraordinary focus, which is superficially homogenous and yet amazingly heterogeneous. I think that's what we've been grappling with um, as we come together in this conversation at the conference. So we're fascinated by the ambition, by this expansion of our ambitions, and yet we find we can no longer delimit or bound our task. And I, for one, sometimes feel my expertise is stretched too far. Oh, yes. Being originally a social psychologist, my interests have long been grounded in the micro. Here's the micro. Um, I want to understand how people, especially the young, generate and sustain a meaningful sense of themselves and their place in the world in a communication environment replete with meanings not of their making. Where I once used to interview people as they sat on the sofa in front of the television, sharing the same soap opera or talk show, though I'm not quite that old, they didn't look quite like that. <laughs> now I interview children in their bedrooms as they follow their interests online or check out their social networking sites. But with the expansion of this analytic domain, the prefixing of everything with the digital, I must widen my gaze. For though the media are more privatized than ever, experienced in bedrooms, listened to with headphones carried in pockets, the digital intersects with an ever widening array of social activities and spheres of life, public as well as private. So this means we must follow digital media wherever that takes us, as we've been discussing here. And we also need a wider view of digital media than we can obtain by keeping our noses close to the screen. 
To this end, I found useful the work of Friedrich Krotz, who pulls together many debates regarding processes of social and, and historical change in late modernity. He argues four fundamental processes are at work. This is no, there will be no surprise, but they are globalization, the transcendence of the nation state with transnational flows of economy, influence, people, and ideas, bringing self and other into newly reflexive but often unequal relations, individualization, the disembedding of traditional hierarchical relations and their re-embedding in often heterarchical or peer networks freed from the constraints or anchors of class, ethnicity and gender. Third, commodification, the interpenetration of instrumental and market values along with practices of measurement, standardization and surveillance into the life world. And fourth, mediatization, as he calls it, the gradual reshaping of institutional and individual realities across all spheres of society to accord with the logic of media systems and media forms. So mediatization we can see as the historical and technological shifting processes of mediation, on the one hand dependent on those former three processes, for media logics are perhaps little more than the logics of globalization individualization and commodification combined. But on the other hand, we see those self-same processes being thoroughly dependent on the existence and expansion of media and communication technologies and services. So just a decade or two um, later, we must acknowledge that life without digital media would not be life as we know it, something it took centuries to say of the book, something I think we still do not say of television. But things are moving very fast, and despite listening carefully to the discussions at this conference, I'm still puzzling over what life with digital media is or could be. So in this talk, I'd like to take from Crotz's analysis three points of critique by which to focus my reflections today. The empirical, what's going on, the explanatory, how shall we understand it, and the ideological, in whose interests. I'm going to illustrate my ideas with some um, excerpts of the empirical work that I report in um, my book, Children and the Internet. But I'm not going to read them out. So now that the first excitement is over and we are afield, as Esther said yesterday, it seems to me important also to be careful and critical of the often strong claims being made in relation to digital youth, digital participation and digital learning. I like Laurie's quote because she is, as it were, both recognizing the new but also modest and aware that some of the hype is overclaimed. So we need to be asking, and I think at this conference we have been asking, exactly what claims are being made about digital media and our, con and our concepts, and are they being sufficiently well defined? Do we know what we mean by learning and participation? Or do we agree? Does the evidence support the claims that are being made and have we examined the contrary claims, the evidence that doesn't fit? Have we compared studies enough or can we yet compare studies enough to find different, that find different or contradictory results so as to understand why? Have we, and I think the answer is no, sufficient independent evaluations of new initiatives? And are we careful in not overextending our claims to all groups, all young people, without sufficient evidence in different settings and sites. I think we're building that up now. I think this opens up a critique of claims about a digital generation or digital youth, and it doesn't take a lot of research to identify some of the struggles that young people have with technology, which I've been interested in in my work, and I'd like to illustrate that point because I feel we've heard a lot of what's exciting and, if you like, successful, and what I find perhaps because I just walk into any child's house or bedroom rather than seeking out those who are particularly expert, I see a lot of struggles. Um, and i just give you an illustration of some of my um, notes from sitting watching children at the computer um, doing what they try to do. This is the activity called going to a website. It can take half an hour, it can involve the family, and it can fail. So 
So I think the observation of young people in front of the computer can sometimes belie the conclusions implied by surveys. We hear 90% of children use the internet or more. The internet is the first port of call for finding information. Teens spend more on time online than other generations and so on. But um, I can sit with a child and um, observe quite an extraordinary mess. Um, a second story. Very often you walk into a home and the parents say, you know, I'm so proud of my child. My child, in this case, is an information junkie. She's brilliant. She can do anything on the internet. The parents who sat a little way away couldn't, in fact, see what she would do. Um, we might not expect so much of an eight-year-old. Um, she went to a few sites and did what she could enjoy, but there was something about the style of Megan's use of the internet that was very fast, clicking around confidently. It didn't reveal, as it were, some of her struggles. Uh, it might, we, we would have to watch quite closely to see that she's not quite, as it were, the digital native that her parents and others were happy to claim for her. Even when I went back to her when she was 12, I could still see things are being done successfully, she is happy, she's enjoying using the internet, she's still confident, she would say she is a whiz at using the internet, but one can observe many things that she struggles with. So if we, over, if we overestimate young people's skills, I think we can underestimate their need for support. A recent survey in Britain found that two in three teenagers check the reliability of what they find on the internet, but this is no more than checked reliability a couple of years ago, and it leaves many who don't, or leaves a large minority who make few, if any, checks. So there are needs for um, support and guidance, I think, as we have, as we've been exploring here today, or yesterday. <coughs> and it's not hard to conduct interviews with children and find that they themselves are struggling and have doubts and find the, this sometimes a difficult technology to use. So I've been trying to understand how do I put together these kinds of stories, these kinds of accounts, with some of the very exciting um, stories that I've been hearing about from people who are really working in very intensive ways with, um, with children and technologies. If we overestimate youthful skills, though, in the generality, we can also under, under, or misunderstand their practices. A headline a few years ago screamed, kids today, they have no sense of shame, they have no sense of privacy. And this was a response to a survey finding that many have set their social networking profile to public. But I found over and again when sitting with kids in front of their profile that sometimes this was a matter of skills, not values. So I would sit with kids and ask them, to they would show me their social networking profile and I'd ask if it was public or private and they would tell me and I'd say, show me how you did that. And then there would be just this hesitation. It doesn't even show up on the tape, but it was just a kind of a, a pause while they thought and they were nervous and then they'd say, well, I'm not sure I might mess it up and my mum will be cross if I make it public by mistake. And um, it wasn't as easy as it, um, is, it might appear to be. When I asked them at the end of this set of interviews whether they'd like to change anything about social networking um, sites, Privacy settings were the number one thing that they wanted to change, as well as getting rid of um, spam and cha chain messages. So they were concerned, highly concerned about their privacy, highly concerned about the skills by which they might, or the, the, the settings by which they might um, manage those. Hardly the responses of a generation that doesn't care, and perhaps those of a generation forced to negotiate its privacy with inadequate tools and impossible privacy policies. So I'd like to suggest that we should change the questions. I think some of the hyperbole around the notion of the digital native or the digital generation reveals a tendency to ask questions the wrong way round, as if the technology is brought into being a whole new species, a youth transformed. If we're to understand really what's new about the digital and how this is tied to other vectors of change in childhood, in family, in education, and so on, I think we need to ask some slightly different questions. So not what can or what does the digital offer to learning and participation, as if we already know what learning and participation are. But let's ask, among all the factors, 
shaping learning and participation, which are probably beyond our expertise or some of our expertise. We have to go out and discover. Among all those factors shaping learning and participation, when and why and how might the digital contribute? And this is a harder task, but if we start always with the technology and ask what can it do, what does it do, I think we'll never escape the charge of technological determinism. So my point is both theoretical. Can we scope all the other elements that frame children's engagement with a particular task, learning, participation, whatever? And it's also methodological. How can we include those in our research? I'll give you another story returning to Megan. Um, I went back to see her when she was 12. This is a story I've thought a lot about. I said, what do you do on the internet? Because my question was technology-led. And so she showed me how on the AOL Kids page you could write this kind of standard, really simple story, and she enjoyed it. And it would have been very easy to conclude that the internet gives her interesting opportunities to be creative, and I would have been wrong. Because then the, we kind of moved away from the internet and we started talking about the rest of her life and the other things she liked to do. And she showed me a story on Microsoft Works, as you can see. And it was just such a transformation. It was a different girl. It was a different story. It was creative. It was dramatic. It was um, textually dense. It was, um, uh, had a fantastic vocabulary. Um, it was a different, it was a different story. So the contrast with the creative opportunity afforded by AOL was striking. And when I went then and said, can I take a look at your bedroom, which is one of my standard things, I found a bedroom full of books. And the books, of course, revealed the source of her inspiration in her story writing. So my question is not, what does the internet offer Megan? But given all the other things going on in Megan's life, many of which have nothing to do with the internet, um, or indeed the digital, though I guess Microsoft Works is digital, what might the internet add? And what about instances like this, where the internet is in fact detracting from someone's creativity? Another story. Mary, who was 18, and some of these are middle-class privileged kids, and I'm deliberately picking them because they are not always um, at the cutting edge of uh, everything that the internet might do. Um, but here was a middle-class girl, um, and she was 18, and in fact, this was a project that was also about civic engagement, so I was asking her about voting. Um, and she was struggling. She was struggling to um, express her civic ideas, um, it seemed that maybe she didn't really have any very clear ideas. She would defer to her parents. She used the internet like many kids do. I don't see a huge amount of creativity there, and nor does she, but she sees it as a useful tool. And if she wants to pursue something she's seriously interested in, like medicine, she doesn't see the internet as a place to go. She goes elsewhere. So from talking to her about the internet, I might say this is a girl who is, as it were, typically youthful, apathe apathetic, um, not really very interested in civic matters. I ask her about the rest of her life afterwards, or we start talking about other things. I discover she's a member of the school council. I discover she has to campaign for her own election in the school. She has to mentor junior pupils. She has to do speeches and stuff, as she puts it. In other words, she uses the internet. She's interested in the world around her. She engages in civic participation, and those three things do not come together. So I'm interested in asking whether this matters. What's the normative agenda here as we think about wanting, as I hear many people here, wanting youth to use the internet for participation? Do we want everyone to use it, just those who choose it, just those who otherwise have no other place to be engaged um, uh, in their civic lives? And is Mary missing out? Does it matter that even though she has her civic engagement and her internet use, the two do not come together? So I want to think a little bit more about childhood and youth and the other things around the internet that are going on in order to come to an understanding of how young people go online. So other things in children's lives. So this is a bit of a random trawl of um, Google Images this morning. 
Um, but I, I was very pleased to find only two children at once inside the shop because that, to me, encapsulates the way in which children's lives in other places are constrained, which is one of my points. So, as um, historians and sociologists of childhood argue, children, it seems, are getting older, younger. They're subject to more marketing pressures, more commercial pressures, the sexualization of their culture, um, the competitive pressures exerted by what's been termed the offensive middle class. There are all kinds of ways in which more and more is expected of them younger and younger. And yet, at the same time, they are staying younger, longer. Their education for longer, their employment is delayed, their entry into employment is delayed, their financial independence is delayed. So they're held for much longer than ever before in a state of tension between childhood and adulthood, between dependence and autonomy. They seem too knowing, too confident to submit to the authority of teachers and parents these days, and yet the expectations on them to compete and to achieve are ever greater. Parents, it's been argued, are trying to recognize children's independent tastes and interests and rights even by democratizing their relations with them. And yet society blames parents for all the ills of youth, adding to the parental burden of responsibilities with every apparent failure of the school or state. Add to this a fear of the streets that keeps children home longer, and one can see how the media look like a solution to many problems for parents and indeed for children. A way to occupy children indoors, preferably off in their bedrooms so that everyone can pursue their own interests. A way to reward them or control them, and an opportunity for young people to express and maybe redress the various tensions surrounding their lives, as we have heard at several points um, in the papers here. So on a wider view of childhood, we can see how the media increasingly fill the gap, occupying not only young people's time, but their private and public spaces, their disposable income, and of course, more fundamentally, mediating their identities, their privacy, their intimate relations, and their wider connections. So at least some of the explanation for why young people are turning to digital technologies, or why society sees technologies as offering a solution, lies neither in youthful motivation to use technologies nor the appeal of the technologies themselves, but it lies in parental uncertainties about what knowledge they have to pass on, teacher sense that the system they're locked into doesn't serve children's interests, the loss of alternative activities, playgrounds, affordable swimming pools, community centers, um, and the extension of the years when youth must be somehow occupied where once they were in work or joining trades unions or learning a valued craft. So we need to look wider than youthful uses of technology in order to understand those uses. Moreover, in today's cynical and uncertain society, highly attuned to risk and lacking in trust and doubtful of tradition, childhood is becoming what Ulrich Beck has um, described as the last place of enchantment. For parents and society, childhood is special, precious, a last hope of, a last source of hope and inspiration making them wish to give their child every, every opportunity, never to deny them. But this tendency to imbue childhood with enchantment and to celebrate its, um, its joys and its pleasures also drives the construction of childhood as threatened, risky, and fragile. In other words, somehow paradoxically, I, I fear that by celebrating children's creativity and positive values, we may inadvertently fuel the repressive anxieties and actions that in seeking to preserve their innocence, also keep them under surveillance and apart from life. So as in this context, I can better understand their search for freedom and identity online in a space that's allowed for them, ironically, by the popularity of that digital native rhetoric among parents and the media. So here's another story, um, a lively and confident girl uh, I first met when she was 12 and then went back when she was 15, um, living in difficult circumstances on a very um, troubled housing estate with some very um, ambitious parents uh, for this girl. Uh, uh, it was a housing estate so troubled that it was, it was quite difficult for me to find a taxi driver who would in fact go there, uh, and quite hard to get there in any other way. So here's a very um, serious girl. Uh, she's articulate, she's very moral. Um, the internet, uh, she tells me, is important to her in various ways, but she would never download 
Uh, she's the only child I've ever sat with who reads the news on the home page and wants to know. But when the mother goes out of the room, I discover there she is um, chatting, uh, like most other teenagers, late into the night with her friends. And the mother, when she comes back, who doesn't know about this, but somehow senses the internet is the threat as well as the opportunity and gives me a whole kind of discourse about how can she um, both uh, in a, empower her child to have the technology and yet somehow she has to manage this and there's a, they then have a row in front of me, which is um, not very common either in interview practice. So the internet is both a source of new opportunities and also an escape from online, off, offline constraints. And in my research, I found that the online opportunities and risks, and I define, refer to both as adults define them, often go hand in hand. So the more children experience of the opportunities, the more also they experience of the risks. And I think this is why the risks have lurked rather present but unspoken about in this conference. And I've seen people kind of walk up to them and then say, oh, no, we're not doing that. But they are tied together. Uh, and um, I think they're tied together in many of the um, uh, interviews and material that I've, I'm talking about here. I think they're tied together for three reasons. First, because children don't draw the line where adults do. So we can talk about opportunities and risks, and we do so happily, but for children, they are fused. What they call making new friends, we call meeting up with strangers. What they call exploring, well, they wouldn't call it this, but what they do as exploring their sexual identity, um, we would worry about, or adults would worry about, as exposing their private selves. Um, they call, re they might remix uh, new and creative forms. We worry about plagiarism and copyright. These are fused activities. Second, I think the design of many of the digital resources they use confuses and brings opportunities and risks into collision. And um, if you search for information on sex, or if you search for images of teens on Google, you will see exactly what I mean. In fact, searching for teens on Google Images without the safe search on is quite something. <laughs> so they're fused. And um, it's a, partly in the design of the um, environment that they're engaging with, we cannot draw these nice, neat lines. Deciding on the difficulty of whether a pro anna forum is an opportunity or a risk, I'd give as another example. But third, the most important reason why we need to keep the opportunities and the risks together is because learning involves risk-taking. To expand their experience and their expertise, to build their confidence and resilience, children have to push against adult-imposed boundaries. So intimacy, identity, privacy, vulnerability are closely related. So I might, I'm inclined to suggest a fourth um, participatory genre here for Mimi and her colleagues, um, which I will call playing with fire. <laughs> children are not weirdly motivated to take risks online. They're motivated to explore precisely what adults are forbidden, to experiment with the experiences they know to lie just ahead of them, and to take calculated risks to test themselves and show off to others. So I see playing with fire when children can hold a lively conversation among themselves about paedophiles. Is the dirty old man in the park the same as the weirdo in the chat room? Um, what about this stranger? Is he a pedo? How do I know? Um, they are trying to work out for themselves what it is that adults draw as normal and dangerous. They can have fun teasing the suspicious man in a chat room. Um, the latest instance that everyone is suddenly talking about is now we've made social networking sites nice and safe, um, is Chat Roulette, where my daughter told me last week, you know, you might be able to go and meet a rapist. Great. But this is not so very new. Once young teenage girls told their parents they were staying at a friend's house and then they dared each other to sleep in the street or the park instead. Now they play with fire online. Um, here's just a few instances I would suggest of playing with fire and um, different kinds. I thought afterwards maybe they're slightly gendered. Um, for young people, these are opportunities. So children, I'm suggesting, learn through taking risky opportunities. And the digital is the realm that we adults have given them to play in. Before that, it wasn't an alternative, te an earlier technology fulfilling this role. It was an earlier place. The, so the shopping mall, perhaps, for social experimentation, the bedroom for intimate experimentation, 
For my generation, there was behind the school bike shed. For my parents, um, this may not apply in America, but for my parents, World War II bomb sites are remembered with nostalgia. So while it seems to me a great ambition to use digital media to empower today's youth, at times I think we're too focused on adult goals in terms of learning and participation, which is understandable given the apparent failures of both learning and participation. And we are perhaps seduced by the apparent coincidence of youthful activities and adult ambitions. So it may look very often as if what young people are doing, engaging, creating, participating, is what adults want them to be doing, and that all that's needed is a nudge in the right direction. But I still see rather little evidence, and I look now at the literature on evaluation, that those adult goals are being attained, um, and that's what I would like to examine next. And for this, I don't blame young people, but rather the adult structures, which I suggest remain rather persistently closed to or imposed upon youth. This is not an elegant piece of art on my part. I probably need a younger person to uh, do it for me. But it captures, um, for me, my sense of the balance between agency and structure. And so the second point I take from Friedrich Krotz's analysis of those wider processes within which the media fit is a reminder to focus on structure as well as agency. And this focuses our critical questions not now on the evidence so much, but on our theory. So how are we going to explain what we observe? How do we identify the determining factors, the shaping forces, and do we risk celebrating youthful agency while underestimating the institutions and structures that shape their lives, state, school, family, commerce? For me as an audience researcher, and remember I started off interviewing families sitting on the sofa, there's an irony here. In the face of an unholy alliance between political economists and popular prejudice, audience researchers sought to defend television viewers against the attack that they were mindless and unthinking lacking in the reflexivity or critical literacy exemplified by scholars and critics. So informed by a particular mix of semiotic, cultural and reception theories, the hermeneutic term was motivated by a commitment to recognize the value of ordinary experience, to hear from marginalized voices, especially women's, and to inquire into, rather than presume about, the processes by which social realities are constructed and reproduced. And this research, I think, paid off. The audience was shown to confound the authority of supposed textual givens by creating distinctive and multiple interpretations unanticipated by producers but meaningful within their life worlds, even enacting individual or collective resistance under the radar through routine acts of tactical evasion. One might say, how much easier to make this case today when our respondents no longer sit still and silent demanding all our efforts to interpret their apparently blank gaze as thoughtful and engaged. Now they click and type, moving around or adding to the text on a screen in the way that we can record their thoughts and, sorry, in a way that we can record. Their thoughts and engagement are clearly evident. And yes, we should seek to capture and interpret this as before. But today I suggest we face a different, but perhaps equally unholy alliance, still involving popular prejudice but now linked not to mass society critics, but to network society's optimists, cheered on by technologists, futurologists, controlling states, and commercial imperatives. What were once interstitial activities under the radar are now center stage in state policy, targeted by innovative educational and participatory technology provision. Once marginal fan activities are fueling big profits, the self-paced -based trajectory of the individual learner, the radical peer-to-peer -peer interaction of alternative activists, all of these are now being built into the agenda of state and commerce. I don't mean to advocate a radical position, nor automatically to reject visions of technologically mediated participation any more than, as an audience researcher, I thought the political economists and critical theorists before them were wrong. Rather, I think we should, as independent scholars, devote a good part of our critical and empirical energies to testing these dominant claims, pondering the awkward findings and examining the assumptions underpinning the digital native rhetoric and imagining alternatives. In other words, I think academics should seek a contrary position and in the face of a dominant digital native rhetoric, this leads me to contradict my earlier role as an audience researcher. So instead of celebrating young people's creativity or sophistication, though I don't doubt it exists, 
I see a value in observing when and how young people lack the skills required to bend technologies to their own ends or struggle to protect their privacy from intrusive others, both because this also exists and because this is the way to argue for the provision of resources for young people and for children and young people. Digital natives can get on perfectly well by themselves. So what are the problems of institutions, structures and resources faced by young people? Let me illustrate some of the challenges first in relation to participation and then learning. First, the repeated finding, um, not very encouraging, but I think often shown, that children engaged in online participation are generally the already engaged, not the newly motivated. So here is Millie. She sees the internet as a great way of pursuing her civic engagement. On, her project, on our project message board, she posted this, horrified at the apparent apathy of her peers. If she wants to find out what's going on, she searches online. To express her political commitments, she joins the Facebook group against the Iraq war. Great, but when I ask further, I discover her father is a professor of political science. <laughs> and as other research confirms, the political commitments or their absence of, of young people and their backgrounds shape the nature of internet use, I think, more than the digital opportunities do in and of themselves. In a survey I did in Britain, this was confirmed across a national sample of 1,500 youth. Some explored the internet for many purposes, and this depended on their skills and, and confidence. Others explored the internet for civic purposes, and this was a matter of their prior interests and background. And the transfer of the first group to the second group was very modest. I'd also point to the difficulty of designing resources to encourage the disengaged to start participating. I spent a while looking at this site, which was built by the British government to try and um, encourage young people to uh, create, to address issues, and to interact um, in ways that we might often want. Um, I, it was a publicly funded project. One click, and you got to a site that looked like this, which illustrates, I think, problems of design. Um, and yet, the producers claimed, um, with some audacity in fact, that this is about participation in the broadest sense. We need to engage with young people in a participatory way. What was the plan? Well, we're putting lots of bits in, in the hope that young people will throw lots of stuff at it. Um, I was fascinated by the difficulty of articulating what participation is meant to be, and evidently they did not know how to translate it into an uh, effective design concept. So there they were, putting stuff in and hoping young people would chuck stuff at it, while having meeting after meeting after meeting about project funding and project design, believe it or not, um, but very little about participation, about what they would do with young people when they posted stuff on the site, how they would respond, how they would moderate, what that meant for the resources behind the scenes that they would need to have. Um, and somehow... In, those, in the statements they made, like, young people need all this information in order to make the right choices, you could hear that adult top-down rhetoric coming back. Teenagers, I have lots of stuff from the teenagers to whom I showed this site, but they were um, uh, universally critical, uh, rejecting it, and rejecting it for all kinds of reasons, but particularly rejecting that appeal to young people as some kind of generic category, as if that was a plausible notion. And then also rejecting it, and many other sites like it over and again um, for, by asking the question, so if we post anything here, if we participate here, who's listening, what difference will it make? I think if we think that youth participation can make a difference and people can be listening, we need to show it, we need to do some evaluations that establish this, and we need to tell young people about those examples, because to them they respond to much of this with cynicism. So this project, which is clearly a failed project, and you'll be glad to know has now been taken down, um, was unclear, um, as I think many other projects are, about what they were trying to enable participation in. And so I just have a set of questions for you that I've been thinking about and also thinking about as I was listening to the papers at this conference about what we're doing in relate, what we're trying to do, um, if there is a we, if we, if we have a, a, a common cause here, 
in relation to youth participation. And maybe all of these different things are possible and we can do um, all of them in different ways, but are we providing um, digital media for youth to use in their own right or a route to change other things in their lives, which is what often they would um, like to do? Are we trying to appeal to the disaffected or those who are already motivated? Are we addressing them for their present rights and responsibilities in the present or as some other projects I think are doing, giving them the skills they'll need as citizens in the future? Are we trying to connect youth to each other or to adults? Um, and really, does the agenda come from them or from us? I think these questions can carry over also to many of the publicly funded uses of technology in education. And in relation to education as well, problems of design abound, often showing little understanding of children's learning. Until I've had some rather depressing encounters with youth and um, digital media and it's nothing to do with the youth. So this was me sitting in an after school club um, and 10 year old children were given a maths game which is a fun way to spend your after school time and they had to navigate a ship around a map and do various things with um, entering distance and degrees. I watched one pair of boys, one who understood what was doing and the, he had to do and the other was extremely determined. Um, and after an hour of playing this rather dull game and um, typing in a few rude words on the way, um, they managed to succeed and they managed to learn something about navigation as well, which was pretty cool. Next to them, then I went and sat with a 10-year-old girl who was working on her own. She crashed the boat several times rapidly. She got very cross. She didn't read the instructions and even when I explained them to her because I couldn't bear not intervening after a little while. Um, she still couldn't do it and she gave up. The game gave her no indication what she was doing wrong and the teacher gave her no indication of what she was doing wrong. So this was a piece of software where you made one little mistake and the whole thing just crashed. That was that. Um, it crashed whether you were near the end or whether you were at the beginning. It crashed whether you understood the maths or whether you didn't understand the maths. It was um, not an example of learning by doing or learning of any kind at all really. Um, but I think there are many instances where children are, as it were, given or the, the supposed fun of digital media um, is resulting in encounters of this kind. Not all do, of course. So um, just to, um, I've been thinking about one other case um, by a colleague of mine, Kirsten Drotner, who describes a school-based animation project in Denmark, which broke with school routine, which stopped the entire school for um, two weeks and everyone got involved in designing a digital animation project um, and the researchers could observe people's decision making, their construction, their working together, their peer interaction. I won't go on about it because we've heard of quite a number of instances of that kind of project in this conference. But the contrast between these two observations raises some questions about digital learning. The parallel my list, I think, for digital participation and here my question is rather simple again, um, not as it were, what do we want young people to participate in, but what is it we want them to learn? And I think we have a parallel set of questions and they are equally um, important. And again, perhaps people can um, uh, build projects that do different kinds of digital learning. In fact, they do. Um, but still, I think there are some confusions about whether we are trying to get as in the maths game, young people to learn the traditional curriculum through digital means, or whether we're enabling them to learn something completely new, as in the Danish animation case. Again, very different. Are we trying, is it good that my bright pair of boys learned something about navigation, or was this meant to be something that would help that rather um, uh, lack, girl lacking in confidence, who in fact learned nothing at all? The question of assessment has been kind of buzzing around the conference but I think it needs some focal attention and um, uh, because we don't really know how we're going to assess um, the knowledge produced by these creative activities. The evaluations as I'm sure you know very often show that there is, need, there is not much improvement in traditional measures of evaluation and I think many of the new and more innovative curricula have not been evaluated very much. And just a question about radicalism. How much do we really expect 
digital media to radically transform the classroom and teachers and our teachers, parents and governments really up for that level of radical transformation. So questions like these bring me to my final set of critical questions, which are the question about whose interests, in whose interests are the changes that we're observing. Um, and the critical questions, as Mark, Mark Washawa has put it, seek to situate technology within the underlying unequal power relationships that exist in society. So this goes beyond identifying and explaining the place of digital media within an account of social change to ask whether such changes are or could be democratic or even emancipatory. <coughs> or alternatively, might they primarily reinforce and extend the interests of established power, whether state or commercial, rather than the interests of young people and the general public. So as Crotz implies in his account of mediatization, and as Henry Jenkins has eloquently argued various places, notwithstanding all the excitement and the good reasons for celebrating the creative and the expressive and the evident new skills being inquired and enjoyed, there is also the sense that maybe the, uh, our uses of digital media facilitate consumerism or commodification via the rise of edutainment, the profitability of learning technologies, the standardization and marketability of learning outcomes, individualization, as we talk very often of collective, of individual rather than collective expression, the promotion of self more than community. There have been some efforts to counter that rhetoric here, but I think very often um, it's more individualized than um, collective. And in relation to globalization and the ever-extending networks, is there a new kind of transnational elite emerging um, that excludes more than it includes, that exacerbates knowledge gaps more than it overcomes them, and creates new forms of illiteracy as well as literacy? So I'll give one illustration of how a wider gaze reveals the scope for this kind of ideological critique. And I'm going to take the recent, recent rise to prominence, at least in Europe and I think elsewhere, of media literacy and digital literacy um, on the policy agenda. So nearly 20 years ago now, Pat Afterheide, Pat Afterheide's report um, from the National Leadership Conference on Media Literacy generated a definition of media literacy that has been widely adopted, though there are other definitions also at work. So as that conference said, media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and communicate messages in a variety of forms. A clever definition because it captured many of the elements that we would like in a definition of media literacy, and it captured them in a way that is, as it were, policy effective. It's a, a short sentence. So the story that I've been following is the story in Britain where the UK's um, new communication regulator took up this definition when it was required by law to promote media literacy, um, though interestingly the law that required that gave no definition of media literacy. So it took up that definition and then watered it down and redirected those ambitions. So here is... Um, one kind of definition, I love the put simply, because that was not a complicated sentence beforehand. <laughs> but now let's put it more simply um, and reduce and water down the ambitions and somehow critical and creative are filtering out and we've developed this whole new thing called protection. <laughs> Just a few years later, Europe debated the um, revision of its major um, legislation on uh, content regulation, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, a tongue twister for those of us who ever want to refer to it. And they said something very similar. Again, watered down, highly individualized, consumers have become the agent um, here, uh, and um, any notion of participation is downplayed in relation to protection. Sorry, did I just repeat two things? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. it feels that way. <laughs> they are very similar. Um, if you're puzzling about what the agenda is really here, um, the UK's Minister for Culture very helpfully stated what this is all about. And it's not about, um, empowerment has become subordinated to quite a different agenda. So the policy of empowerment, as I think we would all advocate it here, may inform a policy of empowerment for states too. 
But it may also be that there's a neoliberal agenda demanding new individualized approaches to governance and risk management so that markets can be liberalized and barriers to global trade removed. One consequence is the creation of a skills burden on parents, teachers and children, a burden that is likely to fall unequally as um, theorized by Ulrich Beck in a very nice phrase, the individualization of risk. In other words, it's not simply digital literacy that's on the agenda. And I think we're sort of aware of it, but we haven't quite focused in on, on it. Literacy is on the agenda in a much bigger way than just the digital. People are talking about financial literacy, scientific literacy, emotional literacy, political literacy. Google is wonderful. Theological literacy, ethical literacy, health literacy, and so on. So the media and digital literacy agenda has parallels with quite different spheres. So policymakers are asking themselves questions like this. Was the financial crash solely a matter of deregulation of financial services, or should individuals with failed pension plans bear some responsibility because they lacked financial literacy? Should states pay for the health care of smokers and drinkers, or is it their fault for lacking health literacy? It's in the context of these debates, I think we should think very carefully about the consequences of um, our involvement in the digital and media literacy debates. And I was always puzzled by Bob McChesney's um, critique of literacy until I, I understood this sort of wider perspective, because he's very critical of the notion of media literacy, um, arguing that a focus on literacy distracts cultural critics from questions of power, for the question becomes less the question should be less what do people do with the technology than who will control the technology and for what purpose. So my question for us is can we um, advocate efforts to support digital and media literacy among youth without also supporting the neoliberal push to deregulate, knowing the unequal consequences of such deregulation? Should we, knowing this, emphasize that the glass is half empty rather than half full, as I have here, in stressing the young people who, as it were, lack literacy and need support, um, or should we celebrate the, their sophistication? Can we be clever in capitalizing on the fact that now, temporarily at least, critical and state priorities are aligned? So, um, conclusions. In reflecting critically on the research emerging from digital media learning and participation, I've suggested we should be persistent sorry, in asking three kinds of questions. First, the empirical, what's really going on? Is there really a generation transformed? And I've suggested there's a more support for the gradualists who identify evolutionary rather than revolutionary change and to identify problems and struggles, as it were, as well as exciting new um, possibilities. It's also clear to me that today's youth are the target of widespread criticism, constraint, and anxiety. They're in many ways a generation under extraordinary scrutiny and often even attack, and hence the importance of the second explanatory form of critique. Although there's much still to be gained from a close observation of the interaction between textual technological affordances and youthful agency, we also need that wider gaze that encompasses the structures that not only contextualize the shaping and uses of digital media, but also condition children's lives more fundamentally. And third, the political or ideological. And here I'm really um, uncertain, because once um, media scholars knew where their critical credentials lay, I think now these are less clear to me, and I'd like to bring this debate, or this question at least, back into focus. So I'm hearing more and more um, uh, scholars who were once, as it were, firmly critical, advocating the importance of the turn to the normative, um, quoting what um, Lars Nair, quote, himself quoting McLuhan, has called the shift of academic interest from the ivory tower to the control tower. So I would ask, what is our role? Are we cheerleaders for change? What are we losing as we rush into change? What new alliances are we forming? And um, while I'm supportive of the many intervention projects that I've been hearing about here, both practical and also policy-oriented, um, I'm inclined to think that we must be tougher on ourselves um, and in our reception of each other's projects if we are to be robust to some of these um, critiques and questions when we, as it were, go further out. So I thought we should all stop being quite so nice to each other. <laughs> anyway, that... Um, I think has done my time and more. So thank you.
long ways. But. So, uh, I now have a double, a triply thankless task. Uh, first is to sort of announce that we're going to go directly into a few closing remarks.